We have two scripture lessons this morning. The first is from the book of Hebrews, from the fourth chapter. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from soul, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And from the Gospel of Mark, the parable, the story of the rich man. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up knelt and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you not, shall not bear false witness, you <coughs> shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. He said to him, teacher, I've kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, you lack one thing, go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, for mortals, it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, look, we have left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. May God bless to our understanding the reading this morning from God's holy word. And welcome special guests, Betsy and Bob Lenskold. How, how easy it is to forget what time church starts. It starts at 9.30, just kidding. <laughs> We're very glad to have you here, Lenskolds. So my oldest niece, Julia, and her husband, Dan, had a baby in April. Precious one's name is Liam. Many of you know that because you've been shown pictures of Liam, whether you wanted to see them or not. Liam, <clears throat> of course, is the best baby ever. 
He's the cutest baby ever. He's the smartest baby ever. He's the most advanced baby ever and all that. But there's something else. He loves to be naked. He loves it. Maybe all babies do. <clears throat> it's been quite a while since I've been around babies and one baby consistently. But love doesn't even begin to describe it. The diaper comes off and he kicks and he gurgles and he dances and he oohs and ahs. He is having the time of his life. And he's completely naked. One of our lessons from this morning mentions nakedness. It may have breezed right by you, it did by me, the first couple times I read it. In Hebrews, we hear these words, before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare. Now I could read these words to my great nephew, Liam, and he'd have no idea what I was talking about, but I can assure you that at his age of six months, He'd be like, yeah, baby, <laughs> bring it on, nakedness for everyone. I'm 57, and those words, all are naked and laid bare before God, do not delight me. <laughs> I am not ooing and eyeing, more like fear and panic. Maybe you can relate. And yet there it is, all are naked and laid bare before God all of who we are and what we do and don't do and what we know and think and hope laid bare and known before God. Naked before God, Liam is psyched and I'm hyperventilating. Naked in the sense of being known, sign me up, count me in. I welcome that, long for that to be known like that, fully known before God and fully known by God, absolutely. So I want you to hold the naked thought, or at least the squirmy happy baby thought. And let's turn to the Gospel of Mark. Scripture tells us that Jesus was setting out on a journey <clears throat> and a man runs up to him and kneels. Got that he's setting out on a journey, maybe he's checking to be certain the donkeys are packed or shaking the dust off his feet before they get dusty again. However one got ready in Jesus' day, he's doing that when a man runs up, runs, doesn't walk, doesn't stroll, but runs up to him and then he kneels. Because the man knows something, doesn't he? He knows that Jesus is no ordinary guy. And then quite famously, the young man asks Jesus about eternal life and how one gets it. <clears throat> and Jesus says, sell everything and give all the money to the poor. Does the man dance with joy, say, yeah, baby, bring it on like Liam in a diaper change? No. The man walks away shocked, dejected. The running and kneeling man thought he had been so good. The disciples thought they had been so good. And Jesus says, with love, scripture tells us that Jesus loved the man. With love, Jesus says, there's more. More to give, more to be, more to do, to follow me and so much more to come for those who do. Now, I'd like you to think of a number between one and 100. Just have it in your head. I'm not going to ask you to tell me what it is, or it's not a test. But <clears throat> have a number between one and 100, doesn't matter what it is. Have that in your brain. And now I want you to take that number and times it by 1,000. So now you have a new number, a bigger number in your mind. That is at least how many sermons have been preached in an attempt to answer the question, what does Jesus really mean when he says, sell what you own and give money to the poor? 
maybe you took 99 times 1,000, 99,000 sermons at least preached on that question. What, Jesus, really? Sure. Jesus, don't you mean what blocks us spiritually from God? We should get rid of that. Sure. Clearly, Jesus, you mean that we only should give away what we don't need. Sure. One of my colleagues says this passage is untamable. I like that. Untamable. This passage is meant to make us uncomfortable. It's a little bit like exercising. If it's not hard, at least a little, it might not be doing any good. Someday I'll preach about the money part of this passage from Mark, but not today. I want to go back to being naked before God laid bare. I offer to you that the running, kneeling man thinks he has figured out in part what Jesus wants. He runs to Jesus, he kneels, he's so excited. He can sense, a colleague of mine says, a, the man can sense that there is more out there than what he has experienced so far. What's the next step, Jesus? What do I do? What's the next box to check? What do I take on? And the answer is nothing. Get naked. Get, lay oneself bare before God. Give things up. This lesson offers that the kingdom of God confronts us with a vision of life and identity incompatible with our presuppositions. We get in trouble when we think we know what Jesus wants. What does being laid bare before God, getting naked, look like? In the late summers, when I take my combination of vacation and sabbatical, a couple of things happen. We usually go to Maine. I eat a lot of lobster. You have guest preachers who are great. You have a fantastic Laity Sunday. I get a break from meetings and emails, all of which are necessary and important. But the break is nice. But in one form or another, every year, something else happens. I take a step back and I think again about what church is, what we do, and why. And it comes to me every year, in some form or another, again, how sacred and holy this is. It's you and me and God and Jesus, however you experience and envision God and Jesus to be. It's God and Jesus and you and me, and that's pretty much it. And in being together, we have the opportunity to be like that man in reverence before God and Christ and to be laid bare, to be to be reminded that Jesus asks nothing less than that we cast aside what we think we already know, our presuppositions, and consider life and faith and each other anew. It's a chance to be laid bare, and it is holy and sacred. Now, it's not all holy and sacred. If you have been here late at night vacuuming up water as it rushes in to the leaky side entrance, that doesn't feel very holy and sacred. And Friday afternoon, I spent time struggling with the wireless thermostat stats, which were no longer talking to the church internet. You can rest assured that that did not feel particularly holy and sacred yet. The time that I take off is great, it's restful, but even better is the way it brings me back to this, to church writ large, the holy and the sacred. 
I'm going to tell you a few things that you probably know. Someone in this church voted for the person that you didn't vote for. And someone here this morning or online sees COVID very differently from you or climate change or fill in the blanks. Again, I'm not telling you anything you didn't know or could have guessed, except maybe this. Here we are together praying, singing, being God's beloved people, together and so different. It's a miracle, really. It's God. It's church. It's God at work in us, on us, all of us, those at home, listening in the car, those who will sit down and watch worship on Thursday afternoon with a cup of tea, or folks who only come here one time. This morning, I invite you to ponder and treasure and celebrate how holy and sacred this is, all of it. When I step back, it's what I see again. And like the man running to Jesus, I want to kneel in reverence and awe. For this, what we do here is something special. It's no ordinary gathering or group of people. This is no ordinary work that we engage in. Holy, sacred. God calls us to be willing to be laid bare enough that our presuppositions can be challenged. That is a life of faith. And here we are, wherever we are, God and Jesus and you and I, and our chance to be laid bare and made new. May God bless us in our running and in our kneeling and in our common life together. Amen.